Are you always looking for the best exercise for bone health? Are you confused by what your doctor tells you to do versus what you read online or hear on YouTube? Well, accepting if you are someone with osteoporosis that you are at high risk for fracture and cannot do resistance exercises, it might be one of the worst mistakes you make in your adult life. What I wanna to do today in this video is to look at the literature and see just how good exercise can be and what has made the biggest difference in the literature and comparing what we are told to do versus what really seems to be actually improving bone quality in the research that's been uh, published and is out there. So I wanna review this with you, so stick around. We're gonna go through three different studies, some of which I've talked about before, but I wanna really dig into the big picture here, which is what you actually have to do to improve bone. So stick around. All right, so this first study I wanna show you is a, a very recent study, and this is what prompted this new video. And so this is a 2023 meta-analysis, and it reviewed what's called High Intensity Resistance and Impact Training, or HIRIT. They looked at 10 different studies, or analysis of studies, that met their criteria. And what I wanna do is I wanna review some of the important points of the, the major studies that are in here. There's two that we're gonna talk about in detail. And then I wanna talk about the conclusions from this meta-analysis and what it really shows that you should keep in mind as you're figuring out what is the right thing for you to do because it's gonna be different for everybody. Uh, a couple of things that I want to mention is there's some definitions in here because there are, whenever you're talking about exercise and medicine, there's always acronyms. So I just wanted to talk about a few of these terms. So one is this concept of one rep max, one rep max. And what that means is when we talk about exercise, we say you're going to do, uh, you're going to do resistance training at 80% of your one rep max. So what that means is uh, how much I can lift for a certain exercise. So let's call it, because uh, we're gonna talk about back squat, right? So we're gonna say a back squat is with a bar on your back and you're gonna do a squat. What is your one rep max? Meaning how much weight can you lift one time, your maximum effort? And then if you're going to do 80% of that, then you just do the math. So let's say my one rep max is 200 pounds my 80% of one rep max would be 160 pounds, okay? So lock that in. And then there's this concept of ground reaction forces. And some of these studies will talk about ground reaction forces because they're really important. Ground reaction forces is when you are hitting the ground, and this is gonna really come into play with impact uh, training. When you're hitting the ground, how much force are you generating? Because force is going to be partly your body weight, partly gravity, but also the, the speed at which you hit. So the further you drop, for example, if you were to do that, the further you drop, the more impact you're going to see and you're going to have ground reaction forces, which could equal a multiple of what's called body weight. So a multiple of your body weight. And this term I actually pulled out of the most recent uh, studies and conversations we've had around OsteoStrong, which is on the OsteoStrong equipment, you can generate up to nine, probably even higher, but for most people up to nine multiples of body weight. So again, let's just say round term, I'm 200 pounds. I'm not quite, but let's just start there because it's a round number. So nine multiples of my body weight would be 1,800 pounds. So that's just a, a benchmark. What they're gonna talk about in some of these studies though is being able to generate at least two multiples of body weight of ground reaction force, uh, which is gonna require some impact and that's why impact can make a difference over just resistance training. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, so let's get into this first study. All right, so the first study I wanna talk about is one that I've actually talked about before. So this study caught my attention, uh, gosh, a couple of years ago. It was published back in 2017 and it's, uh, it's known by the, the acronym LIFTMORE. Um, it's called the LIFTMORE trial. And so uh, this is a study that involved 101 both men and women. And what's good about this study is that it compared this uh, high intensity of resistance uh, and impact training versus control. And so it's always good to have control when you're when you're talking about a study. As you can see, you know what was the impact of this study versus, or sorry, this intervention versus doing nothing, or this intervention, as we'll see in another one, versus another intervention. Um, and so the intervention here uh, was really impactful because they did it for eight months, which is a relatively long time, um, and they had a very clear guided intervention, which I'll discuss. And so the control did essentially nothing. So you're getting up two groups. You have a control group 
and a high intensity group. And the control group basically did nothing. And then the intervention group did a two times per week, high intensity resistance and interval training session. They said they were about 30 minutes long. So the intervention was uh, two sets of deadlift as a warm up of, you know, slowly increasing resistance and then basically three exercises. So they did deadlift an overhead press and a back squat. Uh, those were the three main resistance exercises. And then they also did a fourth exercise, which I'll describe in a second. In the three different resistance exercises, they did five sets of five repetitions. So you're gonna do it five times and you're gonna do that five times, if that was confusing enough. Um, and then they did that at 80 to 85% of one rep max. And they increased that over time as their ability to do the exercise increased. Now, the fourth exercise that they did was called impact loading. And impact loading, they, um, they started out by doing just a simple jumping, but they worked up to being able to pull up on a pull-up bar and then let go. And they were doing what's called you know drop landings or impact loading off of a bar. Um, and this was something that they, these patients were able to tolerate. And I have, uh, I have all of the data, but basically these are people who have osteopenia and osteoporosis, but they are of the appropriate age. So this is a, an age matched group for people with osteoporosis. So I would strongly encourage no one to do this without some kind of instruction, because I think it's uh, potentially dangerous, but we'll talk about safety in a little bit. Uh, they did not have any injuries from this. And I think likely this is what was driving a lot of the improvement. So that's the exercise that they did. And that's only twice a week for 30 minutes. So this is something that if you have the capacities should be very achievable for most people. So, all right. So then um, after eight months, they retested everybody and they looked at bone mineral density. And what they saw is that after eight months, there was a 2.9% increase in the lumbar spine in the intervention group and a loss of negative 1.2% in the control group. Uh, and this is about what you would expect to see, about 1% per year, but in this sort of peri-postmenopausal group, you're likely gonna see between one and 2% of bone loss per year. So that, that kind of makes sense. And a 2.9% increase in the lumbar spine is pretty good. So that's why this study stuck out to me, you know, a couple of years ago when I started looking at all of this be because it was such a significant increase compared to other uh, types of exercise uh, studies. In the femoral neck though, not quite as good. So just barely an increase of 0.3% of bone mineral density, and that's compared to negative 1.9 or almost 2% in the controls. So it was still statistically significant because they pretty much maintained bone mineral density, but they didn't really improve bone mineral density. So I have a whole video on this. If you wanna go back and look, I think it's called Best Exercise for Osteoporosis. So you can go back and look at that. Uh, but the next study I wanna talk about is another study that is actually similar in intervention um, but it's much newer. All right, so this next study is from 2021 and it's called the MedX OP study or MedX osteoporosis study. Now, what's interesting is that they used pretty much the exact same exercises. So back squats, deadlift, and overhead press plus impact training. And I've been trying to think about why, you know, why would you do those things? And then what's the impact that we're looking for? And if you think about, you know, a back squat and you can, you know, look these up on YouTube, but basically a back squat with weight over your spine, loading your spine, you're also loading your hips and you're doing a squat. So that's gonna hit both spine and hips. Deadlift, clearly you're loading your spine. Obviously be careful doing this, but you're loading your spine in, a, in a, an axial way. So you're putting uh, pressure directly through the spine, loading it that way. Um, and I think you're gonna get good spine load uh, through a deadlift. Um, and then the overhead press, similarly, you're loading your spine right through your shoulders. And so I think that this is potentially why we see so much better impact on the the spine than we do on the hip with these exercises because all three of them are loading your spine. Now you're loading your hips as well, but the hips are, they're a different type of bone. They're more cortical bone, less trabecular bone, uh, and they're gonna respond probably to bigger loads. And that's again, where you see that with OsteoStrong, you can have such a, a big impact on the hip. And then impact training, same thing. It looks like they started a little bit slower. So they talk about doing just heel drops, right? So keeping your legs straight and just dropping down onto your heels as an exercise. And then they talked about jumping and landing straight legged. Uh, and then eventually they get into, to, you know, launching themselves off of a pull-up bar. <laughs> so again, no injuries from doing this in this study, but they were being monitored carefully while they were doing this. So what was interesting about this study that I, I like is that they didn't just compare this to controls. And I, I see this kind of feedback uh, on our channel often, which is why would you even compare an intervention to control? Because we know that controls are gonna continue to get worse. And I, I agree with that to some extent, although it's good to know what, what your baseline is. 
but they compared this resistance and impact training to a Pilates-based movement. So this Pilates-based movement is something that's designed specifically for bones, specifically for um, balance control and core strength, as most Pilates-based things are. But they were doing it because it's not high intensity and there's no impact. Okay, so basically we're comparing these these two features. And then they also had some of the patients that were in the trial were on bone health drugs and some were not. And so uh, what we can do now is say, well, of these four subgroups, we can compare this high rate group, the Pilates based group, those on and off of drugs. Okay, so hope that makes sense. Okay, so how did the intervention differ at all from the LIFTMORE trial? Well, very similarly, this was two times a week. They said for 40 minutes instead of 30 minutes. I think they did um, two additional balance exercises. So there was a little bit of extra work there to be done. And then same thing, five sets of each exercise with five reps with a goal of 80 to 85% of one rep max. So same load from a resistance perspective. Um, and then they also did the, the impact. So when it comes to the results, what you can see from the, the high rep intervention without drugs is that they were able to see an improvement in lumbar spine BMD again. So it went up by 1.9% uh, versus basically a flat line uh, with the Pilates-based training. So the Pilates-based training did not improve BMD, although BMD did not get worse as we saw in the LIFTMORE trial. So there's that. Now, when it comes to the femoral neck, you noticed in the LIFTMORE trial, it was only 0.3%, but compared to almost negative 2% of control. So now when you compare high rit to Pilates-based movement, you can see that actually the difference was not big enough to make a statistically significant impact. It was better, it just wasn't better enough because uh, the, the Pilates-based movement saw a subtle loss, but very subtle, basically maintaining bone mineral density and the high intensity resistance and impact training saw a subtle increase, but it wasn't big enough to actually see that change. And as I mentioned before, the Pilates-based movement alone lost bone mineral density uh, in the total hip and the femoral neck, which is concerning. It wasn't by a lot and it wasn't by as much as the control group, but it was still some. So we did lose some bone there. And then the Pilates-based movement, pretty much flat line, uh, did not lose bone mineral density in the spine, but did not gain it either. So before we get to how the meta-analysis interpreted all of these studies, we we'll just take a moment to ask one favor of you. If you are getting value out of this interpretation of these studies, please just do me a favor and click the subscribe button. That's gonna help us to reach more people that are looking for answers about what to do in their own journey with their bone health. And if you have other questions that aren't being answered here or you're tired of looking through all of our videos, consider coming to our free masterclass. That's where I go through a lot of the content in about an hour, leave time for question and answer, and a lot of people have found this to be very valuable. The link for that is in the description below. All right, so what are our takeaways here? Well. It looks like consistently, if we're going to talk about high intensity of resistance and impact, that the exercises have to be intense. That's the definition of high intensity. And that's going to be between 80 and 90% of a one rep max. And that's not easy to do, to be clear. So when I'm exercising and when, you know, bodybuilders and strength trainers are exercising, you know, we're always looking at that one rep max and 80 to 90% is high intensity. I think that's why it's only done twice a week. So you do have to be consistent with that twice a week, but twice a week should be attainable for most people. But this exercise also probably needs to include something that is going to generate increasing in multiples of body weight. So something that's going to generate at least two, preferably probably four, if we're going to get to the hip uh, and we're going to change BMD there, you need those, that ground reaction force. So you need to be dropping, you need to have some kind of impact and whether that's just a heel drop or jumping onto straightish legs or actually uh, jumping off of a, a pull-up bar, you have to do something that's going to increase that ground reactive force to more than your body weight and likely greater than two, if not greater than four, like you would get with OsteoStrong. Now, another important point that I want to mention here is that people will ask me often, especially in comments, not so much from patients, but especially in comments on YouTube, which is how long do I have to do this for? And the answer is as long as you want to see the benefit. We know that what's happening is that your bones are responding to the stress. If you stop stressing your bones, your bones will stop responding. That's Wolf's Law. So you have to continue to push. You need to accept the fact that if you want to have a well-functioning body, you need to continue to stress it on a daily and weekly basis. Now, another thing that I do want to point out, though, and this is an optimistic thing, which is in the MEDEX study, they actually showed that as people's ability to lift weights improved, and we'll talk about that 
Uh, we'll talk about this in another in another study, but we'll talk about the ability uh, to progressively overload. So you're always increasing weight. You're always increasing volume to a point. As that weight increased, particularly with the, the deadlift, then bone mineral density increased. So there is this linear, nice increasing association between bone mineral density and deadlift. And this has to do with the fact that muscle is the most important organ of your body system. I would argue even more important than bone because without muscle, your bones cannot get better. So muscle and muscle centric medicine is a perspective of longevity that I absolutely agree with. And you can see that here. So then in conclusion, what is the role of exercise on osteoporosis? Well, exercise, I think is it's got to be a part of the big picture, we need to load our bones, we need to stress our muscles. But more importantly, maybe not more importantly, but also importantly, we have to work on our ability to balance, we have to be able to prevent falls from a strength, from an agility, and balance perspective, because without those things, then just bone mineral density on its own will do you no good. And this is one of the issues that I see with the drug therapies, because they're just looking at this one thing, arguably not doing it particularly well. And then what about all the other stuff? Now, a quick word of caution, which is I mentioned earlier, you know, don't just start pulling yourself up on a pull up bar and jump off and see how it goes. That's a recipe for injury. Remember that in both of these big studies, all of these exercises were done under supervision. If you don't have anybody to supervise you, I would strongly encourage you to do that. That's how you push forward. You have to ask for help. You have to have a coach of some kind. And this could be a physical therapist, a trainer, somebody who understands how to prevent you from getting injured if you have osteoporosis. I think a big takeaway from the meta-analysis is that we can improve bone mineral density, particularly of the spine, more so than the hip, but you can have an impact with exercise if you're able to load it and impact it in the right way. But that there's no study beyond eight months that I've been able to find. And my guess is what's going to happen is that you're going to hit a plateau if it's all you're doing. So while I think this is these are great things to do, and we probably should do these things indefinitely. Um, it's not enough to do it alone. And you have to continue to uh, add all the other things in. And that's the, you know, basically the the fundamental pillars that I talk about, right? So you've got the, you know, how, how good is your sleep? How good is your nutrition? What is your gut uh, functioning like? Are you getting in all those nutrients? Do you need to have hormone optimization or replacement? You know, all of those things just continue to stack. And this is part of that. But I do see some people that get stuck in this idea that this is all they need to do. Um, and this is important, but it's not all you need to do. I also think that it's interesting that this uh, study looked at a Pilates based movement versus this high intensity movement. And I think that the Pilates based movement, even though it doesn't improve BMD, also does have the ability to slow down bone loss, but may help with fall prevention. And ultimately, uh, we want to reduce the incidence of fractures. And one way to do that is by not actually hitting the ground in the first place. So. I think that it's all important. It's just a matter of what you absolutely need. And this is why figuring out what's right for your bone health journey is so critical. So that's it for this video. I hope you found that helpful. If you're looking for additional information or other ways to connect with us, something that we are launching um, soon at the time of this recording is something called our Health Span Nation. This is a combination of our bone health group as well as our health optimization group. It's a weekly Q&A and kind of topic led discussion of things that are important for longevity and health span can be led by me, but you'll also get um, uh, interviews uh, from other experts in the field and also potentially other team members for topics of interest. So a weekly Q&A, a, a members area for you guys to ask each other questions, and then you get access to all of our discount codes, resources, etc. So that's called the Health Span Nation, and you can head on over to our new website at drdouglucas.com, which will connect to all of the things that we are up to. So thanks again for all of your attention and making it to the end of this video.